What is the spirit of the bayonet? And if you said to kill without mercy, we're well on our way. That's up next. I'm Dr. Christopher Larson, a veteran of the U.S. Army Infantry, founder of One Shepherd Leadership Institute, and author of Small Unit Tactical Doctrine. Okay. I have in my possession here uh, a gift from Indonesian warriors. Um, it is the Indonesian Army bayonet, very similar to our M9 in the United States Army, but still distinctly different, kind of a cross between it and its German counterpart. A nice weapon system. Is it still relevant today? I think that's the big question, right? Why bayonet? Well, hold on. It really breaks into a couple of different things. If we're saying why bayonet training, I'd say, well, physical training. I mean, you're conditioning the human body and you're conditioning warriors' minds to um, to engage in combat. So uh, that would be like saying why saber or foil or epe fencing. Uh, look, or hand-to-hand -hand combat or anything else. At some level, it's just excellent physical fitness. Beyond that, the nature of the bayonet isn't lone wolf, but in fact, it is a line formation battle. So it is teaching you the um, synchronization with uh, your fellow warriors. So you can look at it from that aspect as well. Um, good conditioning of mind, good conditioning of body, good conditioning of the unit as a whole. So bayonet training, it's still relevant for these very real reasons. The bayonet itself in the battle space, well, let's look at this from a couple of different perspectives. On one hand, a massive online charges with the bayonet really faded away even by the American Civil War with repeating rifles, um, the whole notion of firing your musket and then charging forward in a Napoleonic warfare with a bayonet um, had gone by the wayside. It is fair to say that prior to the Civil War um, that that was very much the you could argue the rifleman's primary weapon was the bayonet. You can make that argument prior to the Civil War. By the American Civil War, though, by the end of it, we see repeating rifles coming out, and so the bayonet charge was going away. Was it gone from the, from the history books? Not by a long shot. You have the Boer Wars, and you have World War I, but even by World War I, surprisingly few bayonet charges by unit took place, and surprisingly few of the casualties were um, inflicted by the bayonet. And that continues to diminish to this very present day. So today we have no examples of the bayonet uh, holding sway in a battle. Incorrect. Both in Iraq and Afghanistan, U.S. forces and British forces have on multiple occasions used the bayonet, and not just individually, but sometimes by squad or even platoon. Um, so, and, and in each case, it was, by military standards and metrics, enormously successful. And I, I think that's because when you pull out cold steel and fasten it to the end of your weapon, the enemy understands that you're here to the death. And what a gruesome way to go. They decide, I have somewhere else to be. So in that sense, the bayonet is something of a deterrent. Yes, an offensive deterrent, certainly. I want to take that side of the street, and me and 30 of my bestest friends are going to do that with bayonet, we get that side of the street hands down very decidedly. One platoon in a uh, US platoon in Iraq used it even in a defensive posture that I had not seen before. They were trying to get to a mosque when a crowd of protesters approached them and they wanted the people to understand, hey, we're not going in the mosque, we're looking for bad guys. Uh, the crowd wouldn't have anything of it and decided they were going to attack the American platoon. When the platoon leader had everybody go to their knee and fix bayonet. The crowd soon dispersed, decided it didn't want any part of that American platoon. And so this gives a rise to the question, is it relevant in the battle space? I think from these very um, few anecdotes you can already conclude that it is, but if you accept that it is both a deterrent in the offense and potentially the defense, then you have to ask yourself a different question. 
And the question is, how are you measuring relevance in the battle space? Are you saying, well, machine guns account for 70% of all direct fire casualties, therefore, ergo, machine guns are still relevant. But since we went battle after battle after battle after battle and didn't see nary a one ca enemy casualty with the bayonet, therefore, it is no longer relevant and is obsolete in the battle space. Really, because the platoon that charged across the room with bayonet and the enemy flees, or the platoon that took a knee and fixed bayonet and the opposition decided to give way, there were no casualties in either of those. Again, I'm insisting that the bayonet was used in those cases as a deterrence. So if a deterrence... Um, is used as a combat multiplier, as a combat power, and nets zero casualties, then maybe it's a little foolish to say it's no longer relevant. Let me put that into another weapon system that we're very familiar with in the form of deterrence. Nuclear warheads. Since 1946, i.e. after the end of World War II, since that time, how many enemy soldiers have been killed, wounded, or captured with the use of nuclear weapons? And of course the answer is zero. None. Not in all of that time since, we're talking what, 75 years now? Well, we put a lot of money and science and technology into those weapon systems. Why, if they are obsolete by the metric of, well, they haven't killed anybody? And you know the answer. It's because it's a deterrent. So, I'm going to say that the bayonet is as relevant now as it was ever before. Not just as a deterrent, but in fact as a killing instrument. Uh, that is its deterrent, the cold steel of the bayonet. It's relevant in the battle space. It's revel relevant to physical fitness, uh, your mental conditioning, and unit cohesion and syn uh, synchronized work. It seems to me it's relevant across the spectrum of military uses. That's my argument. You're free to disagree.